Here we are with Trump right now. He is elected, but he's not the president-elect just yet until December 19th. But we see Jill Stein, George Soros, the establishment. They're trying to push this recount before December 19th. They also have things planned after this, like uh, the protests coming up January 20th of 2017 when Trump is inaugurated. Why do you think they're doing this? What What is the push? What are they trying to do here? Well, I, I don't think that the goal of the elites is to prevent a Trump presidency. I think their goal at this point is to perpetuate an atmosphere of tension between left and right. And uh, I think that they're going to continue this. You're going to see this uh, schemes like this all throughout the next year or the first year of Trump's presidency. And I think their their goal, their only goal is to um, continue to increase pressure and tension between left and right, uh, because the end game, it, at least my theory on the end game, is that the left is going to become more even more extreme through this through this uh process they they already are in my uh, to me uh, they seem completely out of their minds uh, i there's no rationale to anything they do anymore but i think they're being pushed even further uh to the extreme left to where you get almost a sort of a militant communism they, they they're not going to be social just social justice warriors anymore i think they're being pushed into militancy and um, i predicted the trump presidency based on the 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 partly on the premise that uh the elites need a scapegoat for the financial crash that they've engineered they've they've set They've put all the – they're removing all the pillars uh, from from under us in order to create this crash in the near future, and they need a scapegoat uh, because I don't think they plan to take the blame for this, this crash when it happens. Um, the perfect scapegoat would be – uh, conservatives and, and or or what they would call nationalists or populists. Um, conservatives in general are the primary enemy of globalists because we believe in s small government and for the most part decentralization. So uh, why not if you're if you're the elites, why not take uh, the crash you create your you created and then blame your worst enemy for it and and that's that was the basic premise and the reason why i predicted that trump would win so i think that right now all of these schemes you're seeing with recounts and and uh, protests and everything else it's just to continue perpetuating this uh this the tensions between left and right and uh push the left towards militancy while pushing the right towards uh authoritarianism um, sort of a early early Europe, early Germany and Italy, 1920s to early 1930s situation, where conservatives decide that they're going to abandon their principles of of uh, liberty and and start exerting force of government in order to combat the threat of the left. So it sounds to me like you're saying they they like to keep America divided right now. That's one of their main goals. Keep each side, have them fight amongst each other. Yes, and in the process, make the the right or conservatives the the villain of our story, the villain of our 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 theater that that they've set up here. Okay, so you talked about the crash, and let me just go back to 2008 for a moment here, um, when Obama took office, and since that time, um, the corporate media, the Fed, the U.S. government, they were out there telling us that the economy is improving. I mean, even Obama came out at the beginning of this year, said, you know, anyone that doesn't believe him, believe that the economy is getting better, you're peddling fiction. Right now, on paper, through statistical information, you know, the unemployment's down to 4.9%. GDP, they revised up to 3.2%. And they're continually making it seem like everything is fantastic. When you look at the economy since 2008, 
up until this point. Do you see a uh, an economy that's strong, that's growing? Is what they're telling us true? Absolutely not. Uh, I would really recommend i you know there's there's so many uh stats and numbers to go through and break down especially you know the the mainstream numbers why they're misleading why they're or completely wrong uh i would recommend people go check out uh, uh an art an article series that i wrote last year called uh, one last look at the real economy before it implodes there's, there's parts one through six i break down Every single uh, government stat, mainstream stat, uh, why it's misleading or why it's wrong. Uh, I break down the re- you know real unemployment, uh, real supply and demand. I go into oil markets, uh, everything, and break down what the what the real issue is and why there is no recovery. Um, basically, since 2008, we've been skating on stimulus. Um, we should have had a, a much bigger crash in 2008. It just it wasn't allowed to happen. We've been kept on life support ever since, and uh, the situation has only grown worse. Um, and just to give you a, a point of contact on that, it's it's funny the um, uh, the initial just today the initial jobless claims numbers they had. Or uh, before, right before the election, they had dropped to 43-year lows, and uh, now this month, after the uh, election, they spiked over 15 <laughs> percent. So after <laughs> Trump gets in, suddenly, uh, all of a sudden, is just everyone's jobless again. It doesn't it doesn't make sense unless it, you look at it from the narrative of well, they're set they're setting it up to where a crash occurs during the Trump presidency, and Trump and conservatives are blamed in the process. You're saying you do believe there's a crash that is coming, and and what you're saying and what I'm hearing is that you think it's going to happen in 2017 during Trump's presidency. I believe, well, when I, and also, you know, when I talk about a collapse, uh, people have to understand that that economic collapse is a process. It is not an event. When, when you some people, when you mention collapse, they say, oh, you've been t- <laughs> talking about a collapse since 2008, and uh, it's never going to happen. It's, you know, it's been however many years. And what they don't understand it, that, is that economic collapse is a process that happens over uh, uh, you know, several years or a decade usually. And um, the, the market collapse, the stock market collapse, is usually the last thing that happens in that process. Um, right now, we're in the middle of that process. I think that in 2017, it's going to accelerate. Um, I think that we'll start to see stock markets affected at that point. So uh, the mainstream, in the mainstream, regular people, all, all they really track uh, as, as far as the health of the economy is stocks. They look at CNN or MSNBC or whatever. They see stocks are in, stocks are at all-time highs. Stocks are green. Uh, that means the economy is good. And they then they walk away. They don't look at anything else. Um, this coming year, I, I think that uh, stocks are, are going to start crashing. And that's when the mainstream people in the mainstream are going to start to question the validity of the recovery idea. Do you think this is going to be a natural crash where things just naturally fall apart on their own or do you think the elite are going to bring the system down well it's funny because they they've actually been artificially uh, uh propping up the system since 2008 and uh, the system has become so utterly dependent on stimulus measures from central banks around the world that really the only thing they need to do now in order to create a, a, a global crisis is just to remove the stimulus. That's all they have to do is just shut off the, the spigot and a crisis will occur naturally. So I, I think that they're just going to pull they're just going to pull the plug on the life support and step back for a little while at least and just watch what happens. When this happens how bad is it going to be? Is it going to be like 2008? Is it going to be like the Great Depression? Is it going to be worse than both of those times? I think it'll be 
definitely worse than the Great Depression. I don't think, um, you know, that that I think people have uh, some cinematic ideas of what a what a economic collapse is like or what a crash would be like. I think a lot of people envision some kind of a Mad Max scenario. I don't think that's necessarily how it's going to be. I, I do think it'll be, a, you know noticeably worse than the Great Depression. When this collapse happens, do you see bail-ins at all occurring here in the United States with, with the banks? Yeah, it's it's definitely possible. I think uh, you will see uh, definitely government uh, pensions, um, you know, things like that being confiscated in order to pay uh, other debts. And uh, I think maybe towards the end of the the end of the game you will see banks starting to to lock off uh you know accounts or giving haircuts to larger accounts as we saw in Greece and Cyprus um it's it's hard to say how far that could go it it, it you know in the US i i do think it could go as far as account confiscation do you also think that there might be shortages? I mean, the people say when this hits, we'll have some type of credit freeze and it will be very difficult to get products because once credit freezes, trucking, deliveries, that kind of all breaks down at the same time. Do, do you see that coming? Yes, I could I could definitely see that coming. I think uh, that what the, the end game would be in the U.S. at least would be a nationalization of certain uh, freight and resources um, the, the 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 government's already set up as far as uh, national emergencies they're already set up to do that they're already set up to confiscate uh, and manage resources from the private sector so uh, I, I think that would be the the end game are you in the camp of inflation or deflation where do you see this uh, going, do you think we're going to see a deflationary type of crisis, or do you see inflationary type of crisis? I would, I would actually see it as a stag, stagflationary, which would be sort of a combination of. It would be the worst of both worlds. Uh, it, <laughs> I think um, probably some elements of of Weimar Germany hyperinflation and then uh, uh, Great Depression uh, deflation. How long do you think this will last? I mean, many people ask me, they write in and they say, you know, how long will this crisis last? I mean, will it be a week? Will it be two weeks? Um, when the market falls, I'm talking about, and, you know, the corporate media and the U.S. government, they all recognize like, oh, look, there's something wrong here. Um, how long will this last? Well, the international financiers the central bankers um the global elites they've they openly uh suggest have suggested in the past and uh, you know articles published in and uh publications like the economist uh the goal of a world currency system by 2018 so i would expect First, that whatever's going to happen is going to happen between now and uh, uh, early 2018, um, because that's the, that's their window of time to create enough uh, uh, chaos and desperation in order to convince people or r to rationalize the idea of switching to a, gl a global currency system. Um, after that, I th I would expect there would be a process of acclimation or acclimating uh, the the public to this new system, and I would expect that we'd probably be a lot of countries would probably be, be in third world conditions uh, for a while after that. Now you talked about a, a new currency. What are you envisioning as a new currency? I mean, Jim Rickards is out there, and he's saying that. The SDR is going to be the global currency. Do you, do you agree with that? Yes, and actually, the if you go back uh, to I believe 1988, the Economist published an article, uh, I believe titled uh, "Get Ready for a Global Currency in 2018." And in that article, they outline exactly what their what their plan is, what they plan to do, which is to introduce the 
rights, uh, IMF's special drawing rights, the, the basket currency system, as a bridge to a new global currency system. So they get, they'll get national currencies all coupled into the SDR system uh, and the IMF pegging these currencies and dictating what their values will be according to the SDR system. And once they've done that, they'll start uh, moving people, getting them acclimated to a just a single global currency system. What happens to the dollar at this point? Do people still have the dollar? Do we still use the dollar? Well, I, I think the plan is to kill the dollar's world reserve status, and that will... Uh, severely limit the dollar's value on the global market. Um, I, I would say that we'll probably still have our our dollars, our green dollars, with the presidents. That we'll still have them for a while. They'll we'll still be able to look at them and say, "Hey, we've got we've got a currency." But the the value will no longer be uh, dictated by the you know or or controlled by the Federal Reserve. I think the the Federal Reserve will step aside for the IMF, and the IMF will become the new sort of uh, global mediator of currency values. What's going to happen here in the U.S.? You know, everyday people that are out there working, they're going and and going to their job, they're using the dollar. Uh, is the the people's way of life is it going to change when we move to a new currency? In certain parts of the world, uh, most definitely, I think in the United States will be hit the hardest because we are so absolutely dependent on uh, the dollar's world reserve status for uh, there are our um, level of the level of luxury that we've lived in for you know, at least half a century. So I think. For people in the U.S., it'll be a, uh, an extreme shift from first world down to uh, basically third world living conditions. And I think uh, there it, it will be a disaster. A lot of people will, um, you know, there are people who, who will die in, the, in this process. Um, just as the during the Great Depression, you had a, a lot of people die during that process and move move into poverty starvation you know it's it's going to be a disaster how do you think people are going to handle this i mean uh, i mean think about all the people that are sleeping who are just going about their everyday lives not even thinking about a collapse because they've been telling they've been told that everything is fine and then all of a sudden their world collapses around them they're not prepared for this how do you think these people are going to react uh, some will react violently, um, but I think the elites have staged the situation in in a, such a way that a lot of people will be confused as to who to blame, and that's sort of that's the great advantage that they have is that they've they've staged the situation to where. Uh, you know, the especially people on the left, they're going to, they're automatically built in, you know, uh, they have an automatically built in bias to blame, uh, you know, either Donald Trump or Republicans or conservatives in general. Uh, on the right, I think you're going to have a lot of conservatives blaming, uh, the left as being saboteurs, as sabotaging Trump and <laughs> and um, ruining ruining his chances of fixing things. Um, you, you're also going to have all kinds of different, I think, events in in between black swan events, terrorist attacks, things like that, that uh, sort of can really keep people confused and and looking every other every other direction except at the global bankers. And that's what they want. They don't want they don't want anyone focused on them. They're gonna create as much chaos as possible during this, in order to keep everyone at each other's throats. While they're sitting back, they're gonna be uh, you know lounging on the Riviera, uh, you know, <laughs> sipping a nice drink and and just watching. What is the reason they they, they don't want anyone um, blaming them? Why do you think they don't want people to understand what they're doing? Why do they want to keep everyone distracted? Well, I think because we are getting to a, to a point in history where 
the the globalists are more exposed than ever before. There's there's the access to real information on their uh, on what they do, their schemes, who they are, the organizations that they've built. Um, it's all out there. If people start to, if the general public becomes aware of who they are and the fact that they're behind this crash, um, it would be all over for them. I mean, you're you're talking uh, torches and pitchforks, and it would be all over for them. So they really do need to keep a lot of, uh, they need to keep mass confusion. They need to keep everyone focused on each other and not them. Otherwise, their their entire apparatus of control falls apart. So that's, that's one reason why, you know, the information war, uh, you know, as it's called, is is so important. If if we can get enough people aware of, you know, and focused on the bankers first, not the left, not the right, but the bankers first. And yes, there's there's going to be useful idiots that we got to deal with in the process. You know, there's going to be crazies on the left and and so on and so forth. But but get them focused on the bankers, then we might be able to at least uh, uh, remove them from the picture and rebuild in a in a proper manner. Because really what this is all about is who's going to rebuild. The system's going to crash regardless. Uh, but, you know, we still, can de- we still can determine who rebuilds afterwards. If it's them rebuilding, then we're, we're kind of done for. Um, because they're going, to, they're going to use the crisis as a, uh, a rationale for centralizing everything into their one world system. If we can remove them from the picture, then we might have a chance to rebuild, you know, with a, a freer system. Do we as a people, and not just the United States, but other countries, do we actually need the private Western Central Bank? No. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> simple answer, no. I, I, you know, the, the only purpose that a central bank serve is to uh, control uh, money supply, interest rates, and and to manipulate geo geopolitical uh, uh, environments in nations. That's the only reason they exist. They're a tool for manipulating governments and uh, public, you know, social consciousness and economic consciousness. That's that's the only reason they exist. They only serve the interests of the elites. They do not serve uh, the interests of the public in any way. Why does Congress, the executive, why do they keep the central bank around? What what incentive is there to keep it around? Well, there's there's a lot of incentive for political leaders. It, I would suggest um, people who are are maybe skeptical on this whole concept of you know globalists, the you know evil globalists in a smoky room uh, uh, planning world domination. If they th- they find they're skeptical about that. I'd, I'd actually suggest they read a book called Tragedy and Hope by a man named Carol Quigley. He was a, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He was a mentor to Bill Clinton. And he open, he breaks down in that uh, book exactly what the global elites, what their plans are, and how they... Um, how they've been able to insinuate themselves into the politics of almost every nation with the central bank and and dictate basically through a, uh, various incentives um, up to and including putting these people putting these politicians into power. Um, that's how they've been able to uh, control governments and and by extension, the <laughs> that's why governments have never. Uh, move to shut down these central banks. What is their end game? What do they want with the people? What do they want in each one of these countries? Uh, the United States, Canada. What, what I mean, what exactly do they want? Well, I if you're talking, um, what is what what do they want a hundred years from now? I I think uh, in a hundred years, uh, I think their goal is to have a uh, total. Uh, uh, economic domination, a uh, one-world government, um, and a reduced population. 
and um, you know, I, I, we could go further into that. The, the population—that's a big one. But, but uh, uh, you know, carbon, uh, carbon, the carbon taxation agenda. You know, um, Agenda Twenty One, uh, Club of Rome. If you look into all of that, there's there's ample evidence that that they would prefer to have a much smaller human population. Uh, I, I, I suppose ostensibly because that would be easier to control a uh, smaller population. Um, but I think they see themselves and, and um, if you read some of their, their publications and some of their, uh, uh, the philosophies that they, that they promote, I think they see themselves as sort of philosopher kings from, you know, the philosopher kings from Plato's Republic. They see themselves as as born to rule and uh, the the smartest men in the room, and uh, they believe that um, the system, the ideal system, would be them sort of as, <laughs> as maybe as Egyptian pharaohs. Uh, just kind of god kings lording over the the rest of us, and uh, they don't like to be. I don't think they like hiding in the shadows. Uh, I think they 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 believe they deserve to be uh, revered, and they're moving the world towards a uh, a, a situation where they they will be uh, if they get their way. Do you think they would go as far as uh, creating or pushing a civil war here in the United States? Yes, I I do, and I I recently or I, my last article was uh, on that that subject in particular. It's called "The Reasons Why Another American Civil War Is Possible," and I I think that again I, I as I mentioned before I think they're pushing the the left towards militancy, but not with the intention of having the left. Uh, win. I, I think they actually intend to throw the left to the wolves, as it were. I think they they're they're going to, s- to sacrifice the left. The the left's y- usefulness has um, has subsided, and I think the the only use for the left now is to to push conservatives and people on the right towards. Abandoning, abandoning our principles of, of small government and liberty and becoming authoritarians. Because really, uh, the war, um, for the globalists, the war is on the uh, ideal of, of conservatism, uh, individual liberty, and sovereignty. The, for them, they have to, it's not enough to just destru- to, to fight uh, conservatives or the fight fight people on the right or libertarians whatever there it's not enough for them what they have to do is destroy our principles and destroy our ideal and make them uh, akin to something terrible so in the future when people look back at conservatives they'll say oh that you know look at how horrible they were they were just like the Nazis or, or, or whatever. And um, in order to do that, they have to, uh, they can't do that. They can't, they can't just demonize us themselves. They can't just destroy our principles outright. They have to get conservatives to abandon those principles altogether and act like Nazis. And I think that's, that's the purpose of a civil war in the United States would be to get the left a militant and to push the right into authoritarianism. I also see that the U.S. government, the central bankers, the elite, that seems like they've been trying to convince everyone that the people, they don't have rights. They're actually privileges. And we see this through Common Core, which is now in most of the schools. And a lot of the textbooks are teaching the young that um, you're not born with them. They're actually privileges that the government hands to you. And Through this, you know, fake news, conspiracy theory, um, free speech zones, um, the call to get rid of weapons. It seems like they've been trying for a very long time to try to remove the rights of the people. Do you see this also? Yes, and I I would see it more as an indoctrination of 
uh, uh, more specifically millennials and um, pushing millennials towards the extreme left, um, which again, I, I, I don't think the, the end game is for the left to become dominant. I think that they're going to throw the left uh, in the garbage and, uh, uh, you know, in the hopes that through the left's insanity, uh, the right will become will become authoritarian in the process. It will become the villains of of the, the story. If the central bankers, the elites, get their way, you know things are not going to be good for America or the world. How do you see the U.S. if the elite and the central bankers do get their way, where they crash the system? They introduced a new world currency. What will America look like at that point? Uh, if they if they get their way, I I imagine that you will see some people will fight back. Um, I'll probably be among those people, <laughs> um, but it won't be. It will not be fun. It will be. It will be horrible and. Um, so I, you know, you're going to have insurgencies in the United States. You're going to have probably certain parts of the United States, probably certain major cities, turn into uh, something like a green a green zone, like you see in in Iraq, um, where it, you know the the uh, people who are willing to dis arm who are willing to placate and 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 follow the rules they'll so they'll be allowed into those cities um there'll probably be access to to food and clean water and and uh amenities and um something similar to a normal life uh you know in those cities but it'll be a completely you'll be completely enslaved in the, in that environment um outside the cities i think that you'll see uh, a martial law sort of situation and uh you know insurgency for for years to come i mean we've been talking about a an economic collapse the central bankers the elite what can people do right now to prepare for what is coming uh what do you suggest people do at this point if this crisis is coming up very soon well the best thing i believe they could do especially if they have some some savings in the bank would be to invest in your own your own productivity um uh, focus on being able to produce your own necessities uh you know food uh, clean water shelter uh, uh security, you know, all, uh, electricity, if you can produce, the more necessities you can produce for yourself um, and the more you can remove yourself from dependency on the grid, the better off you will be if there is a crisis. And even if you think I'm, I'm completely out of my gourd, I'm completely nuts and none of this is going to happen, uh, you're still better off um, being able to do those things, it's you know, it's a better life. It's a cheaper, it's a cheaper life. It's you know, it's a, it's a not a bad way to live. I live that way, uh, and uh, you know, even if I'm completely wrong, hey, you're at least you're uh, more self-sufficient, and um, so really, that's the best, that's the best option. Uh, also, of course, you know, there's in any economic crisis, there is a window of time. There are windows in which precious metals are uh, the best option as far as a currency, um, and uh, so I would suggest that people put at least 10% of their savings into gold or silver. Should people keep a, uh, a weapon and cash on hand for this upcoming crisis? Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent. Actually, it's, it's, it, you know, one other thing I should mention that's important is, is it's, it's not, ju it's not j enough just to be, um, you know, relatively self-sufficient, because nobody can do everything themselves. 
So uh, the next stage after after producing a lot of these things yourself is to start uh, building mutual aid groups and working with others and, uh, uh, you know, setting up a network of people who are self-sufficient, so a, a community, um, because that's really the, the future, in my mind, is going to be, uh, you know, independent communities all over the country, uh, you know, localized, self-sufficient, and able to weather uh, the economic storm. And, and, you know, if we can get enough of those communities out there, then there's that makes America economically redundant. It makes us safer. And it also allows us uh, the ability to, to fight back against any kind of authoritarianism that does arise. Because if you're dependent on the system... There's, you have zero chance of, of fighting back against it. If you are self-sufficient and you have community, then there is a chance that you can fight back. Brandon, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? Uh, you can visit me at alt-market.com or hyphen market.com. That's altmarket.com. Brandon, once again, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on the show.